Hello everyone, and welcome. We should be live at this point, so let me double sh make double sure that we are muted. And yes, it says we have an excellent connection and we are now live. So yeah, very, very welcome. Thank you all for being here. And um, yeah, so I'm joined today by Thunderous One. The topic is going to be Islamic Munitheism, which I've covered on three other channels. Uh, just not on my own, and it's time that I do this on my channel. So thank you for those who are here. Um, XYZ, thank you for the support. Josie Wales, uh, Veronica at the well, and uh, I believe, okay, well, those are the guys that I, the names I see, and uh, Thunderous, welcome. Hi, everybody. Um, hi, Lloyd. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well, yeah. How have you, well, how was your day? Uh, my day is okay, you know. I'm um, looking forward to the show and discussing uh, Islam and monotheism and um, the uh, the monopoly that Islam has on this um, this faith system. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, guys, yeah. So some of you may have seen this. However, I need to repeat this on my channel, but we're going to be talking about the early beginnings of Islam, basically proto-Islam and how Islam originally started or evolved out of Babylonian monotheism, out of Babylonian moon worship. Now, that particular thesis has been discussed for a couple of decades. However, it actually is very credible. And we'll, as we go through the series, we will discover why. And I think you will go, you will find more information here than has been presented up to now. And I will provide all the resources in the description or in the comments later. All right, and here we are. So, Islamic monotheism and the moon gods of Babylon. So, we'll be talking about Yemen, Ethiopia, Abraham, and Makkah, or al Makkah, and we'll learn about al Makkah. Uh, yes, <laughs> Veronica, the well, these images, yes, you'll notice these are the early pagan images from Yemen and from Ethiopia. So, notice you'll see here the crescent and the early star. In some cases they're a sun disk, but they're also a star disk. So yes, these are early images that date to the first millennium BC. This symbolism goes way back. Your thoughts, Thunders? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, um, we're talking about um, Ethiopia and uh, Yemen and Saudi Arabia, but um, in my research, which I did many years ago, um, the image of the crescent-shaped moon, uh, the, the world um, in archaeology seems to be replete with this and um, pagan idolatry. So it's not geographically uh, restricted to one area or one period of time either. Um, history shows that so this symbol uh, seems to be a consistency uh, through history and man's um, fascination with uh, worshipping the stellar objects. Agreed. Very agreed, very much agreed. Yeah, and this is actually a photo taken of a mosque with the moon in the background. Maybe it was photoshopped. However, uh, I will say this. In Christianity, we revere the cross. So the cross sits on top of our churches. It's on the walls of the churches. It adorns our holy spaces because we revere the cross. It has meaning, historical as well as spiritual meaning. Islam reveres the moon, which is why the moon is on all of their holy spaces because it has historical as well as spiritual meaning. I think this is obvious. So this, hence this is called monotheism. Right, so summary of the overall thesis. We will examine archaeology, history, language, as well as the Islamic sources. Christianity was an early arrival in Arabia and had an impact. However, prior to that, there was Babylonian paganism. Proto-Islam can be traced to Yemeni and Ethiopian paganism. The Ethiopian paganism was brought there from Yemen. Proto-Islam is based on pagan moon worship. The Arabian pagan gods were copies of the Babylonian, Sumerian, and Canaanite gods. We also know that there's no early evidence of Mecca in Arabia, and we will cover that in some depth. There is evidence for many Meccas in Yemen. The main Arabian pagan god, oddly enough, was called Mecca, and you might have heard of a very popular city in Arabia called Mecca. And uh, then, of course, we will have a look at the mystery of Makaraba. This is the location that Islam likes to claim, that Muslims like to claim, was the earliest mention of Mecca in the second century. And we will learn about where Makaraba is and also what Makaraba is. Any comments before I continue, Thunderous? 
Um, do we have any kind of estimated time as to when Christianity actually hits Saudi Arabia? Or the um, Arabian Peninsula? They're, so they're definitely... So Paul actually was in Abitia. He was in Petra in, in the first century. So we know this already from the Gospels. And then you've got a solid presence in Arabia. You're looking at the fourth century at least, if not sooner. Okay, because um, I think for, as far as uh, Muhammad's uh, concerned, the earliest that I can find, I, I dare say in Islamic literature, it would be the earliest. And that's his, um, was it his uncle or his first wife's uncle, Waraka, was a, 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 a Christian um, kind of priest right. of the time. Well, uh, let's actually have a look at this, since this is interesting. This is from the Biblical Archaeology Society. Now, they collect together biblical evidence, archaeological evidence that aligns with the Bible. In this article, the earliest evidence of Christianity in Arabia, I'm about to do a video on this for next week. This is a rock inscription from the Jordanian desert, and it invokes Jesus. You'll see this rock inscription here, and the Jesus portion is actually here, right? And this article I will discuss with you guys later in the week. So this is Petra here. This is Wadi al-Khudari. This is Amman, Jordan. That's Jerusalem here. So this is now in Northern Arabia, and this is where this was found, in this field of rocks. And you'll see here, this is the name of Jesus. And it says here, possibly the earliest witness to Christianity in Arabia, the Jesus inscription from the Wadi al-Qadari is a memorial inscription, meaning that it commemorates a deceased person. It consists of three parts. It gives the inscriber's name, a commemoration of the deceased uncle, and concludes with a unique religious invocation to Issei, which corresponds to the name given to Jesus in the Quran, O Isa. Help him against those who deny you. Uh, so, what, yeah. Sorry, it, that Isa, what language is that in? Safiyatic. Sorry? Safiyatic. So it's not an Arab word then. So the Arab Isa is, um, right. that's the proto to Isa. Is yep. Isa. Right. Now, if we have a look here, if we look for the Safiyatic, Safiyatic, so there are 17 Safiotic words in the Quran right here. Right. This is interesting. I, I, I don't want to digress. I'll just make this comment for the audience that um, if, we, if we go back to um, the, the discussion about Islam and 124,000 prophets, Adam was the first prophet and he came directly from um, heaven to earth. Um, he spoke Arabic in heaven and it would have been the purest form of Arabic that ever existed. Um, and Why Islam are finding like, Arabic inscriptions. The, 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 exactly that. So we're not finding historically the purest. That, uh, we're, we're finding that uh, from uh, if we go with the Islamic narrative of Adam being the first man on earth, moving towards uh, Muhammad, which incidentally is only twenty-one generations. So there's a problem there for um, Muslims, whereas the Bible has seventy-three from Adam to Jesus. Go figure the mathematics. Um, or math, if you're American. Yes. I don't if want you, to dwell uh, too far off because no. I want to get back to the topic. Yeah, yeah what, what, what I comment was is why are we finding the further forward we're going in time, um, more non-Arabic words in the Quran with what we're discussing, when it should be more Arabic or pure Arabic from, from when Adam came to earth? That's What's a fair right question. Time? Yeah, that's a very fair question. So you can see here... Uh, there are a number of over 50 different languages represented within the Quran. So I will leave this here for the moment. Okay, guys. So, yeah, let's jump forward. Thanks. Those are very good points. Hello, Marek. All right. So I'll start off with Yeha, a, the Sabah Kingdom site in Ethiopia. Right. So a Sabah Kingdom site in Ethiopia. Yeha is a Bronze Age site near Aksum in Ethiopia, the largest archaeological site in the Horn of Africa, showing African contact with South Arabia. Welcome, Sergeant Gingrich and Dragon. Welcome. Thank you all. Hello, Marek. Yeah, so what we have is this site that shows us that Africa and Arabia were linked. Now, Sabah is the historical Sabaean kingdom of Sheba. We've all heard of the Queen of Sheba. She's very well known from biblical sources, you know, as well as from Islamic sources. Now, Yeha is the precursor to the Ethiopic Aksumite Empire. This was at that at that time the fourth most powerful empire on earth. However, it was also an empire you've never heard of. Right. <laughs> uh, son of Aram. Yeah, I asked myself what that Norse word in the Quran is. Yeah, look, you'd have to download a copy of um, 
Uh, check in the description. There'll be a link to my Google archive, my full research archive. Go and check out Jeffrey, um, uh, Arthur Jeffrey's um, Foreign Words in the Quran. Look at the book, <laughs> figure it out for yourself. Yeah. Okay, now, established in the 8th century BC, this site includes temple, elite residence called Grat Bel Gebri, and rock cut shaft tombs. Sabaeans, these Sabah here, were a Semitic people from an Arabian kingdom in western Yemen. So let me actually just go to a map so that... Right, so while the map is taking a moment to load, okay, here it is, just a slight delay. So let's have a look here at what we're dealing with. So this here is Aksum. This is Mecca up here. This is Aksum down here. This is the Horn of Africa. This is Arabia. This is Sinai Peninsula. This is Egypt. So we are looking at this area down here called Aksum, and this is Yeha. All right. So now the Sabians were Semitic people from an Arabian kingdom in Western Yemen. So they invaded from Yemen into Ethiopia and their empire flourished from the 8th century BC approximately to 275 AD. So they were in the first millennium BC up to the third century AD. Now this temple, oddly enough, is known as al Makka Temple. Now you might notice the similarity to a certain place in Arabia, which is very, well, which is very important in the Islamic religion. And I will make a note that the Yemeni Q sound becomes an Arabic K. So al Makka becomes in the standard Arabic al Makka. And Makka, have you heard of Makka before, Thunderous? Um, it rings a bell for some reason. Uh... <laughs> yep. And yeah, we're going to be talking about this a lot. So let's have a look at an old map. This is Mecca. This is where the Kaaba is. Okay. Obviously, it's known as al Makka. Here you've got Aksum and yeah, I'm getting some feedback, Thunderous, um, from, I'm getting echo and feedback from your mic. I'm not I'm sure hearing why. Myself. I'm hearing myself. Okay, let me just so, try some else. Okay, so what I've got here is Aksum and Yeha. And what is interesting, as we will discover, is here in Yemen, just below Najran, we have another al Makka temple. And what is interesting is, there will be more than one. There were many, many of these al Makka temples. And al Makka was not just, well, it was also a place. So we'll find many of these Makka temples in Southern Arabia. Josie Wells, oh, oh, thank you very much for the comment. Um, it's really worth clicking the links and educating yourself. Lloyd has done, Lloyd has done the hard work and the deep research. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so let's continue. Let's have a look at these Sabaeans. Who were these Sabaeans, these Sabah? They are mentioned in the Quran. They are also mentioned in the Bible, and we will discuss that. So let's have a Muslim perspective on these Sabaeans. Muslim writer Muhammad Shukri al-Alusi compared their religious practices to Islam in his book Bulukh al-Arab fi Akhwal al-Arab. Arabs during the pre-Islamic period used to practice things that were included in the Islamic Sharia. They, for example, did not marry both a mother and her daughter. They considered marrying two sisters simultaneously to be the most heinous crime. They censured anyone who married his stepmother. And interestingly, these moon-worshipping Sabaeans who copied their religion from Babylon, they made the major Hajj and the minor Umrah pilgrimage to the Kaaba. They performed circumambulation around the Kaaba. They ran seven times between Mount Safa and Marwa. They threw rocks and they washed themselves after sexual intercourse. Any thoughts from you, Thunderous? I can barely hear you, Thunder. Sorry, your your audio is very soft now. My... I cannot hear you, Thunder. Try again. Say something, please. Is that any? Is, uh, That's much is better. That... Yes, keep going. Okay, so my first thoughts were that if a Muslim writer is actually looking at Islamic practices today, as they are, or as when they were being formulated um, during Muhammad's time, and he's done research and found that these practices pre-existed, is that not a damning indictment uh, of admission? I would say 100%. This is from pagan moon worshippers, right? 
So these are exactly what Muslims do today. These are Islamic practices. Notice, he says, they also goggled. They sniffed water up into their noses. They clipped their fingernails. They removed all pubic hair and performed ritual circumcision. Likewise, they cut off the right hand of a thief and they stoned adulterers. These are Islamic practices as they are today. And this is, thank you very much, B.A. And, and this is the practices of these Sabaean moon worshippers. So in effect, that the, it, was this concentrated in and around Mecca, these practices at the time? Um, or did they originate elsewhere or were they... We'll get into this. So these guys, these guys controlled Yemen. These guys controlled Yemen, this area here. They invaded and they took over Ethiopia. However, at one time, they also entered this entire area, one for commerce, they had trade routes overland, right? Now, they were sailors, they had trade routes going all the way to India and possibly as far as China. And they had trade routes going all the way to Greece, Italy, and into Turkey. And then also they had land routes and they were certainly present in Yemen. At one time they conquered and controlled the land, possibly up to the coast right here in Israel. So they controlled all of this area here at one time. So perhaps there's another belief ideology that do these things. And this was pre-Islamic Yemeni moon-worshipping pagans. Exactly, Josie Wales. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yes, there was a lot of mixing, a lot of spreading of these ideas. Let's continue. The Sabaeans have five prayers similar to the five prayers of the Muslims. Okay, what a coincidence. Others say they have seven prayers, five of which are comparable to the prayers of the Muslims with regard to time, that is morning, noon, afternoon, evening and night. And the sixth is at midnight and the seventh at forenoon. Now, those who are practicing Muslims and those who know Islam a little bit will know that you don't have to do just five prayers. You can do two additional prayers, which will give you extra reward. Uh, do you know anything about that, Fundarus? I've never come across that before, but I did want to ask a question. Hmm. So it, it, this seems all like grafted on into Islam under a very thin veneer. It's basically paganism with a thin veneer of monotheism. Yes. But and that's what we're going to be discovering. This is yes. going to be a lengthy series. We're looking at about eight hours of content over several weeks. But yes, this is what we're going to learn, that Islamic practices, as they are today, derive originally from pagan moon worship. Okay, so if, if the rationale is to be explained to, say, a Muslim that's listening or for anybody that's going to take this information to a Muslim... The, the Quran has the account of um, Muhammad going to heaven for, um, and is bartering yeah. with Allah from 50 to 5 prayers. Is that the justification to get the 5 prayers? Uh, we, would have to five ask prayers? Those, we would have to ask those questions, but perhaps they would have to try and explain it away so that people look to that story rather than the fact that it is actually derived from Babylonian that's pagan moon worship. That's the point I'm trying to get at. Yes. Exactly. That's a fair point. Yeah. So... Now, it is their practice to pray over the dead without kneeling down or even bending the knee. They also fast for one lunar month of 30 days. They start their fast at the last watch of the night and continue till the setting of the sun. That may sound familiar to you. Some of their sects fast during the month of Ramadan. They face the Kaaba when they pray. They venerate Mecca and believe in making the pilgrimage to it. They consider dead bodies, blood and the flesh of pigs as unlawful. They also forbid marriage for the same reasons as do Muslims. That's in Volume 1, page 121 to 122. Uh, Lydia, were there any child sacrifices? There may have been. We'll, have to, we'll get to that later. We'll touch on that. I don't know if it's this strictly relevant, but we will head in that direction. We will be talking about Baal, and we will be talking about Moloch. So that will come up later. There is a connection to Islam as well. Now, in Bulkh al-Arab fi Ahwal al-Arab, we read, the four sacred months, Rajab, Dual Qada, Dual Hijjah, and Muharram, had been considered sacred during the pre-Islamic Jahliya. Raids, taking revenge, war, fighting, and disputes were forbidden during them. Does this sound familiar? Well, you used the word Jahliya. I was just trying to work out myself. How could it be a period of ignorance if all of these practices were grafted into Islam? Exactly. <laughs> That's a fair question. If Islam is copying these practices, how are they ignorant if Islam is duplicating them? Now, raids. Now, this will all be explained in the future as we go, but raids, taking revenge, war, fighting and disputes were forbidden during them. If a man were to meet his enemy who killed his father or brother during these months, he would not quarrel with him. During the sacred months, people were under restriction not to fight or make raids and had to remove their spearheads as a sign that they would avoid fighting at all costs. Of course, the corollary of this is that not during the sacred months, 
they were raiding. Muhammad was a raider. They were taking revenge. There was war. There was fighting. There were disputes. This is jihad. And we will get to that as we go. Thank you, XYZ. Yeah. So obviously, Islam borrowed the hallowing of these months from pre-Islamic Arabs and introduced nothing new into the world. Abdullah Abdul Fadi, in his article or book, Is the Quran Infallible? Page 127. All right. Any comment before I go on, Andres? No, go on. Go on. All right. Okay. Now let's have a look at Al Makkah briefly. Let's look at the proper noun, his name. Now we will come. We will be dealing with Al Makkah continuously as we go. We'll be filling in more and more blanks as we go. The name is Semitic, and in the Sabaean it's Al Mukh. There are. You will find we will go through at least a dozen versions of this name. <laughs> Josie Wells, brilliant point, thunderous one. I think you hit the home run there. Time of ignorance, but we'll copy them anyway. <laughs> Fact. So this is Al-Makkah, right here. And this is the Ethiopic, the Gez. Remember, these guys invaded Ethiopia. And from the Gez, you'll see the very strong similarities in the writing. So this is Al-Makkah, Al-Makkah, right? And he has at least a dozen different names. Now, he's a moon god, once worshipped in Yemen, Saba or Sheba, and in Ethiopia, in Aksum. In his synonyms, amongst many others, are Al-Makkah or al muk right? Now, the Sabaean capital... Now, also, look up the current name of Mecca. It's Al-Makkah, Mukarama, al muk So, both of these names, Al-Makkah, al muk are both in the current names. The sounds are both in the current names of Mecca today. The noble, right? So, the Sabaean capital was Marib, 120 kilometers east of Sanna. Yes, Lydia, it does. A seafaring people, they built great irrigation works, castles, and temples. In a British museum installation on them, they were called the oldest and most important of the South Arabian kingdoms. Okay, and in and Sabaean, Saba here. And also in Arabic, the Sabaeans were called the Asabaiyun. Right. We shall continue. This is where they were. So this is Marib, the old capital of this region. This is Sana, the capital today. Right? And this, you can see Ethiopia is just across the water here. So this is where Marib was. We'll continue. Now, there were many other al makkah temples, and we will come across, again, we will ref we'll flesh this out and come back to much of this. Now, dedicated to al makkah the moon god of Sabah, it measures 14 by 18 by 14 meters, or 40 by 60 by 46 feet. That is the temple to al makkah that we discovered. Being Sabaean, it is similar to the temples of Sabah kingdom capitals, such as the al makkah temple at Sirwa, and the al makkah temple in Marib. So now we've got at least two more of these temples. Right. If I go back here, if we go down here, you will see Sirwa and Marib. In fact, if we go to Marib, we'll find two of these temples and another one here at Sirwa. They're just a few kilometers apart. These two are about a thousand meters apart here. Right. You'll see these two are very, very close. This is the old temple right here. Right. Now. After Marib, Sirwa was the most important economic and political center of the Kingdom of Sabah at the start of the 1st century BC on the Arabian Peninsula. So they were an economic powerhouse. They were influential. Right. The continuation of ignorance. Yes, guys. Right. And in front of the building was a platform, oddly enough, with six pillars called a propylon. This is very important. Called a propylon. Grat al Gebri, the palace, also once had six pillars. Be better. Do you know what Marib means? No, what does Marib mean? I probably have it somewhere in the notes, but I cannot remember offhand. So if you can let us know what Marib means, that'll be very interesting. Thank you. Right. Now, Yeha has been identified as a pre aksumite occupation. This is based on 19 archaeological inscriptions on stone slabs, altars, and seals found at Yeha, all written in a South Arabian script. Right. Now, what is interesting is that these people, at one time, these people, they had writing. Right. They, they were an advanced civilization. They built dams. They built cities. They traveled all over. They traveled to India, if not China. They traveled all the way up the coast. They, they traded with the Greeks. They traded with the Romans. Right. They were all the, all the way across this coast here. They were all the way up and down here, all the way up this coast. They had writing. And then, for some reason, at the time of Muhammad, writing disappeared. Right, which is very odd. And it comes back later. Thunderous? No, I was just thinking, because you were saying that, the, obviously these people were very well developed um, for that yes. particular period of time. You get the sense of that because the Queen of Sheba visits Solomon. Um, yes. So that there's a good thing there. You have the Ethiopian eunuch in the Book of Acts. But also the trade routes must have been, as you said, set up 
before Muhammad because um, there's historical references of mosques being in China just after Muhammad's death or maybe 100 years after. You can't do that unless you've already got relationships in the trade route set up. So as, it, it seems I, I'm following, I can see the in in this in the length of in the near, near time span you can see that it, that this had moved on from things that had already existed. Fair point. That's a very fair point. Yes. Now notice these one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pillars. Now what is important are not the pillars as such, although the pillars certainly have relevance. Understand? What is important are the spaces between the pillars because you enter from the secular world into the holy world, into the temple, into the, uh, what's it, the, uh, we'll get to the word later. You enter into the, um, into the holy sec section through the spaces. Now let's count the spaces. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven spaces, seven prayers, right? So you entered into the pillar. You entered through this false archway, this false door into the temple. Okay, so center of prosperity. So ironically, Westerners would complain to this that the practice they don't like had been part of the local culture before Islam. Yes, and we will discover those practices go way, way back. Okay, let's continue. Now let's look at this. Let's look, these are the eight pillars at the Awam Temple, okay, to Al Makkah, the Temple of Al Makkah in Marib. Now let's look at this one. It's got six pillars one, two, three, four, five, six. This pillar is broken off. Six pillars will give you five spaces. These are your five ways to get to God, right? And those are your five prayers. So those five spaces, five prayers, right? Eight pillars, seven prayers, right? Six. So basically, it's like denominations. It's simply like just denominations of the same pagan church, right? So slight differences between them, right? Now, let's have a quick mention about this. This site, okay, of the Himyar annexed Sabah. Right, Himyar and Sabah, these are basically this kingdom here and next the guys next door to them. That's pretty much what happened here. It was clearly a royal site under the Muqarabs, right, under the Muqarabs, and probably directly under a king. And then you've got this place called Najran. Now, Najran is formerly a Christian town, which was in the south of Mecca just yet. It used to be part of Mecca, so it used to be, sorry, it used to be part of Yemen, and this was where Christians were very much concentrated they used to do pilgrimages to this and also the heretics and the gnostics were heavily concentrated there now the town of sirwa seems on onomastic evidence this is based on words right on onomastic evidence to have early contained speakers of arabic so now we know that these yemenis had arabic speakers amongst them the town played no role in islamic times right so its influence had diminished by then but its site became a great mythic one for Islamic historians. Now, that is really odd, right? And there are frequent citations of Arabic poetry mentioning it. So, culturally, it's still very, very important. And it was very important for them. They remembered it. But, yeah, your thoughts, Thunderous, before I move on? Well, I, I, the, the, my first thought in all of this was, um, you, you and I have discussed this before about Egyptology, that the narrative was set up in the 1800s and then, any information that comes along to challenge it, they throw it under the bus or they dismiss it. Um, I think good examples, I think it's Jonathan Templeton or David Rall that challenged the narrative. In this instance, you've clearly done a lot of, a lot of research. You, your, your resources are, are impeccable. Do you not find in all of this information that you're looking at that there are historians or archaeologists that challenge each other in what they're finding? Um, because it seems to me that when you look at history, there are maybe two or three narratives where they're making an interpretation that fits what their presupposition is. You're looking at this objectively and you're, you're joining the dots. Yep. Do you find yep. that there's a frustration in yourself when you're reading articles that maybe conflict with what the reality is? So what you find is that the scholars have all of this, this wealth of information in these silos, right? but they don't connect it to the next item in the next silo. They, they keep them separate. It's almost mm. like they are unwilling or afraid or for some reason they, they, they refuse to make that connection, to join that's, those dots. 
that was my next question. I was going to say, it could either be ignorance or arrogance, but also with Islam, you are playing into the fear factor and, and the threat is very real. Because the information is there and it's, you, when you read the language, you get the feeling they don't want to say what the obvious conclusion is. Yes, exactly. So let's have a quick look at Awam Temple. I'm going to utilize here the Smithsonian Institute, right? It is not Wikipedia, just so we know. Now, Wendell Phillips and his team excavated the great walled enclosure of Mahram Bilkis. Now, the Mahram, that's the word I was wanting earlier. When you go through the pillars, you enter from the secular world into the Mahram, right? The holy space. And Bilkis is the queen of Sheba. The ancient temple of Awam, dedicated to the moon god, al Makkah. Now, it's very important to realize. Now, here, when, when you spoke of contradiction, Thunderous, mm. I will show dozens of references, dozens, as we go through this, this discussion. As we go through the next through the episodes of al Makkah being mentioned as a moon god. Now there is one outlier, a single outlier, where al Makkah, the moon god, is termed by, by two scholars to be a sun god. And Muslims pounce on that. They pounce on it and they try to the to the exclusion of all other evidence, more modern evidence, uh, in scriptural evidence, archaeolo archaeological evidence. They will try to deny that Al-Makkah is a moon god, and they will try and make him a sun god. Now, it doesn't help their case, because either way, it's a pagan god, which is ultimately connected to Allah. But we, all of this will become clear as we go. But here is something, and the moon god theory is so much more, there's so much more data for it, evidence for it. Mm. Because the sun god one is actually very flimsy, and it's easily dealt with. But yes, so there, there is that. So there... You know, you do find small contradictions and sometimes you wonder how they got to this. But I can explain that one and we will in the future. So now, this Wendell Phillips, who worked for the Smithsonian, he was doing archaeological excavations in 1952 with his team. And decades later, the government of Yemen invited Marilyn Phillips, his daughter, to continue her brother's work. Okay, her brother. Okay, sorry. So to continue, and this is dated 8 September 2014. I've got some other documents up to about 2017 or 2019 discussing this. But during the war, they had to stop, of course. So have a, let's have a quick look at something. These are called the Raja Jil. You'll sometimes see Raja Lil. Okay, so these names occasionally differ. Raja Jil and Raja Lil. Raja Jil columns or stele. Archaeologists working in Saudi Arabia continue to puzzle over the meaning of more than 50 groups of oddly arranged standing stones, the most famous of which are found at the site of Rajajil, near the ancient oasis town of Al-Juf. That's up north here. Okay, Thought to date to the Chalcolithic period, which is 4500 to 3500 BC. In other words, this is 6,500 years ago. They, raised, they were raised more than 5,500 years ago by an unknown people. Many pillars are now fallen. Others are tilting heavily. These were erected in Saudi Arabia's Al Juf province during the 4th millennium BC. Let's have a quick look at what these look like. These are standing stones. Do these look familiar, Thunderous? Didn't we just see... Notice the broken ones next to it. There, there. Sorry, the broken the, stones. The image hasn't come up for me yet. Take care, XYZ. Thanks for being here. There we go. Yeah. Right. Do you see these standing stones? So this is in Saudi Arabia. And in Yemen, you had the religion with standing stones as a mm. sign to their god. These look familiar? Yeah. So these are from a people from five, 6,000 years ago. Very similar. Yeah. Now, Al-Juf was a significant stopover point on several ancient land trade highways, which connected the Arabian Peninsula Egypt, Mesopotamia, and Syria. It's the Arabic Stonehenge. Josie Wells, you are correct. We will talk a lot about that. We will certainly. I will show you. For instance, there are at least 50,000 such sites in Arabia. 50,000. Right? We will cover that later. So, but yes, it is very much a, a, a Neolithic site. Correct. So one trade route. One of the oldest land routes in recorded history ran from Yemen and parallel to the Red Sea coast through Medina. Okay, what is called Medina today? Alula and Madain Saleh. Okay, let's have a quick look. So we've got Medina. We all know where Medina is, right? You've got Mecca and Medina, right? Here we go. So Mecca, let's go Mecca to 
Medina. Let's just make sure we have all of that marked correctly. Mecca to Medina. Okay, so Medina up north, this is Mecca here in the south. Okay, that's Mecca to Medina on the map. Okay, they mention Al-Ullah as well, Alula, which is going to be very important, and also Madin Sari. But let's, so here you've got this, right? This was a trade route, a very well-known trade route all the way from Yemen, from this region here, from this region here, all the way up to here. And they even went as far as inland, up into Syria, up into Turkey, right? They went here and all the way up into Turkey as well. Now, um, let's actually have a look at Alula. So let's actually have a look. This is this might be very interesting to you guys. Uh, this is Alula in Saudi Arabia. This is Alula. Have a look at this. This is Saudi Arabia. Right. Clearly, there was some sort of advanced civilization. You can see there's numerous things like this. But also, you're going to find, later on, we will discuss Alula, and you're going to see evidence of archaeological sites that go back 7,000 years. Sites like this, far more sophisticated ones. But you'll see sites and excavations of this nature going back thousands of years. Uh, any comment from you? Um, not not only um, I, I personally, um, and this is my my own personal opinion. I've challenged the the timescales of seven or six thousand years, but um, it, it kind of shows, irrespective of what the timescales are, um, the advanced knowledge that they will have had in um, structure and arrangement, um, uh, also with scale as well. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not primitive people, and it shouldn't be considered that they are clearly very well advanced. Yeah. If you look at some of these constructions here, look at some of what they've done here. These people were able to do these things. And also the size of this, this is like 90 to 100 meters or more in size. Mm -hmm. These are 100 meters or more in size, right? So that's the kind of thing that you're seeing in Alula, right? So this kind of, this civilization, which was this Neolithic civilization producing this, welcome, Eva, welcome. Welcome, Jordan. So, so we're traveling, traveling north. Okay, so these guys went to Damascus, they went up to Turkey. Turkey is going to be very, very important for us as well later. So by traveling north and northeast to Arjuf, then east in this way, the road avoided the harsh sands of the great Nafud Desert, right? And the stones may, may have indicated the presence of a crossroad and the safer route to take, or they may have been temples. And just, when, we, just... when we get to Turkey, give me one sec, when we get to Turkey and we talk about a place called Gobekli Tepe, that should make a great deal of sense. But these may well have been temples because Gobekli Tepe bears similarities to these. Uh, yes, Thunders? Um, Josie Wales mentions a comment, uh, makes a point, says, wow, it looks like it could be Egyptian. Now, that was something I was, uh, I've actually been pondering on my mind from um, shows you've done on other channels, that um, this is all very celestial. Um, yes, in its correct. But the, the Egyptian pyramids have an alignment with celestial objects as well. So is there a connection between Egyptology and their structures? Because we're looking at proportions, we're looking at fantastic, uh, um, tech, well, technically advanced people in proportion and their, their building okay. and well, architecture. Is there a link? So tell you what, okay, this is an archeological examination of the Kaaba. Now this is getting well ahead, okay? Because this is at the very end of the presentation. However, the Kaaba is situated very specifically. This wall of the Kaaba points directly towards the summer sunrise. This side points to the three stars, which is the handle of the plow. So it is astrologically aligned. This points to the winter sunset, and this wall points to the rising point of Canopus. Canopus is the second brightest star in the sky. The Kaaba itself represents Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, but not only that, these walls also represent the four winds so it is meteorological as well as astrological so the alignments of the Kaaba okay so the first of the winds is the Sabah which is easterly of the Kaaba facing the wall between the black stone and the southern corner it blows between summer sunrise and the rising point of Canopus the second is Janub which is southerly and blows from the rising point of Canopus to the winter sunset so now you've got these these points that point to the winds so this is entirely astrological. I will jump ahead to something else. So we're going well ahead, but since the question has arisen, I'll bring this up. I want you to see this. 
So this is the cover, right? And what is important is this. Notice these people moving counterclockwise. They actually move counterclockwise around the cover, right? Then notice Sirius, right? And notice the stars in the heaven moving counterclockwise because the Kaaba is God's abode on earth, whereas this is his abode in heaven. This is the Neolithic belief. And if we continue here, you'll notice here you've got the moon. This is the crescent moon. This is the Kaaba, which is Sirius. Here is the disk of the sun. And the people move counterclockwise around the star. Is is there a connection there? Because in Islamic, um, yes. in Islamic parlance and um, their narrative, they will say that in Allah's heaven there is a Kaaba there as well. Yes, and correct. The Kaaba and this is the earth. representation on earth, and this, this is Allah's but, Kaaba here. So when they're talking about heaven, they, it, they are implying the spirit realm where Allah exists, but the reality yes. is it's not. It's actually the the the, 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 the star Sirius, and the circumambulation re represents the uh, celestial objects moving around Sirius. Yeah, from we'll get to that. That's uh, look. That's about seven hours from now. So let's get to that later. <laughs> well, it's diff it's difficult, uh, Lloyd, because we're, all these questions start to get raised. Yeah, we know, I know you know I what know. you're bringing up. Yeah, I know. So, well, let's continue. So you've seen these here, right? So you've seen these these stones, like right? these pillars. And yes, there is an Egyptian connection. We're not going to dig into that. But notice here, this is Alula. You'll see these. I've shown you some of this stuff. Okay, they're called mustatils. In so you can do a Saudi Arabia Alula pendant. And you can look up Mustatils on Google. Play with that. I'm still working on this particular slide, but that should give you. Now, let's briefly talk. I don't want to go too long tonight, guys. So we'll I'll do this one in bite-sized chunks. The Propylon. We spoke of those pillars. They're called Propylon. They are pillars before or in front of the gate. Yes? Okay. So they come from the word propylia, which are monumental gates or entranceways to a temple or religious complex. A symbolic, secular slash religious partition. Now, in the Century Dictionary Encyclopedia, it tells us, in ancient Egyptian architecture, monumental gateway, usually between two towers in outline like truncated pyramids. But the important part is, it is an ancient Egyptian practice. It's a monumental gateway. Okay, a monumental gateway. In Chambers' 20th Century Dictionary, and these are just two examples, it's a monumental gateway before the entrance of an ancient Egyptian temple. These are derived, so way back in history, these were derived from Egyptian practices. Now, let's have a look. Does this building look familiar, Thunderous? And do you see the monumental gateway, the propylon? Oh, my word. Yeah. Does anyone know where this building is? <laughs> Any guess, anybody? Right? So, yes, this, this might look familiar to you. Right? This is the, I believe it's called the Al-Mashid Al-Haram. This is in Jerusalem. Right? You'll notice the monumental gateway, the false pillars leading to the mosque. Right? And notice here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight in front of the door. Right? Notice the false pillars in front of the door. That's the dome with the rock, exactly, right? And you've got the propylon in front. Let's have let's continue, right? What about Saturn and the black cube? The North Pole of Saturn as a cube? Yeah, look, that's outside of the scope of this discussion. I mean, that remains to be seen. I don't have anything to to add on to that at the moment. But that's outside the scope of this particular discussion, right? Axum, right? So now. Aksum was one of the four great powers alongside Rome, Persia, and China. According to Mani, this is the founder of Manichaeism. Now, Aksum was one of the four great powers and the power you've never heard of. So, in other words, they competed with Rome, Persia, and China. They must have been incredibly powerful. They had influence over Ethiopia, Eritrea, Somalia, Arabia, Egypt, Egypt. And they had extensive trade contacts with Asia and the Mediterranean. The Aksumites developed Africa's only indigenous written script called Ge'ez. And this is what they used to make, these little pillars here. They also had pillars in their religion. Let's have a quick look. Sabaeans in Africa. So around the middle of the first millennium BC, there were Sabaeans also in the Horn of Africa. So these Yemenis traveled across into Ethiopia, in the area that later became the realm of Aksum, also known as well. This is Eritrea and Ethiopia. right? And notice... The Sabaeans, they were holding to the national cult of al makka right? The cult of al makka They were mixed up with various non sabaean communities, so they mixed with many, many other communities from the region, as far away as China, possibly. 
India, Greece. They were definitely involved with Greece and Rome. They were mixed up with various non sabaean communities, and it is still much in dispute how one can envisage the actual demographic and political situation. Bigger than the Egyptians? Why have I never heard of them? I don't know. I'm not sure if they were bigger than the Egyptians, but they were a powerful, powerful... I mean, Rome, Persia, China, and these guys. And you've never heard of them. That's crazy. I know. How can one not hear about an empire here that, that was incredibly powerful? But yeah, let's continue. Now, briefly, these stele, these little standing stones. Hello, Arnold Nathaniel. Welcome. Right. So, some remarks on the origin of the Aksumite stele, and this is a paper by Rodolfo Fatovich. This paper is to investigate the origins of the Aksumite stele in the light of Near Eastern and African megalithism. Right? So, in other words, these megaliths were all over the Near East, in other words, Arabia. The possible funerary stele of the third millennium, so they go back 3,000 years, were found in the Negev, so even in Israel, right? The Negev. So, they are associated to cairns of flat stones, 7 to 8 meters in diameter. Cairns of flat stones, these flat stones, we just saw those in Alula, right? These little round cairns of flat stones with the burial in the middle, okay? So, at Bab ad Dahra in Jordan, they were also here in Jordan, they were all over the place. They were a sanctuary devoted to the ancestor cult from the fourth and the first millennia BC in Risca in southern Jordan. So, in other words, this kind of thing was all over Arabia, from Jordan all the way into Africa. Uh, now, the Aksumite Empire. So let's go to National Geographic. Uh, do you have anything you want to say, Andres? No, I, I just <clears throat> two things. One, I've never heard of the these Aksumite people before. Um, to consider they've got they've had an empire, I find that surprising. And second of all, you showed the image of the pillar. Um, how is that any different from an obelisk? Not very much, because back in the day, right? Back in the day, this was everything. It was Egypt, as far as you, when the maps. Back in the day, the the maps were basically round, and this was all you saw. Right, if you go back mm. to old maps, right, and then you had Egypt on the maps, and then everything was sub Egypto, right, below Egypt. Ethiopia at one time meant or indicated anything below Egypt. Yeah, right. So understand. So these guys inherited from Egypt, even Babylon, right, has they they all somehow claim or they have an Egyptian influence. They claim an Egyptian influence that tied originally back to Egypt. But what is interesting, what you guys may not understand, there are inscriptions in this area of Africa. This is Egypt here. This is Ethiopia here. Now, this is outside of the scope of this thing, but I'm just going to mention it because I will talk about it another time. You see here where I've got this Star of David. This is called Solib. Okay. This is this location here has the oldest Yahweh inscription, right, in the world. This is where they found the oldest inscription in the world to the god Yahweh. Okay. And these people are called the nomads of Yahweh. And they were the enemies of these guys. The nomads of Yahweh. They worshipped a god called Yahweh. Hi there, too many Marys. Welcome. Yeah. So, so these guys were the nomads. So this, this inscription goes back three and a half thousand years. So in other words, it rivals what we know of the Egyptians. So in other words, Yahweh, the name of the god Yahweh, and the practitioners who followed Yahweh, they go way back in history. They, they rival these kingdoms. So that's just an aside over there. Right, I'll continue. So National Geographic. The Aksumite Empire was a wealthy trading nation in northeastern Africa, achieving prominence by the first century. They were unifying and controlling a large territorial state and had access to trade routes linking the Roman Empire to the Middle East and India. And the Aksumite Empire introduced Christianity to the rest of sub-Saharan Africa. Now, archaeologists have found evidence of a complex society called the Diemat or Dimit, now, Dimit has a word. This word, we'll get into that later when we start talking about idol worshippers. And we start talking about the early meaning of where the word Islam comes from. Right? Called Diamat or Dimit, that preceded the rise of Aksum by several centuries, based in Yeha. Now, here we've got this Dimit in Yeha, and in the Tigray Highlands, about 50 kilometers northeast of Aksum. This will be tied to Islam later. Okay. Now, it was strategically positioned at the crossroads of trade routes from East African coast to the African interior. So this means they were trading into Africa. And trading partners included most of the major states in the known world. Egypt, South Arabia, the Middle East, India, and China. These guys were very evolved, very advanced, very wealthy, and powerful, and also highly influential. So yeah, how we, and their most important commercial trading partner were the Byzantine Romans. I'll pause here. This is where, notice, they controlled at least this region. So they controlled probably further east here, 
and they controlled, they had influence. At one time they invaded and they took over all of this region and even controlled Mecca, or very nearly controlled Mecca. Your thoughts, Thunderous? Yeah. No, I've got no comments on that. Um, this is this is this this material now is new. Anything to do with Axumite, I have no um, clueless on. Yeah. So they were a very powerful, as you can see, seafaring nation. They went all the way up to again Greece, Rome, right? So these guys travelled extensively to India, China. So these guys had very strong links. So they so there was a lot more going on, and these guys were the first to spread Christianity. Now, what is interesting, Christianity is dated, in their case, to probably the late third fourth cent early fourth century so the 200s these guys were already practicing christians and they were spreading christianity throughout the rest of arabia in fact they took christianity into arabia here as well yes, as can I, just, yes? can I just ask a question the axiom might they're, they're clearly responsible for trade and if you like networking if you want to use yes. a better it, it, now you we're using the term they were very powerful and they they were doing business with greece greece and rome and places like that is it in context, and just so that we I can understand this correctly, America is a powerful country, and Amazon is a powerful business com uh, company. Are we looking at it in, in the context of power in a different way? Because when we use the term power, we're looking at it from a, a, a powerful country point of view. What we should be looking at the Axumites is maybe a very powerful business point of view. Is they that were influential, but they also had a strong military. They invaded this area. They took over this area okay. at one time. They controlled this militarily. They okay. controlled this area for about 75 years. Okay, so it wasn't some kind of Amazon or DHL where they... No, they were they very just... economically powerful. And even after the military occupation ended, they were still economically influential. Okay. Yeah, they still were culturally and economically influential. So now let's have a look at some coins, right? Now, all of these pieces will be joined together, right? Coins. Aksum was the first African country to mint its own coins. So they were quite advanced. They were in gold, silver, and bronze, and they were in the standard weight categories issued by the Roman Empire, which tells us they were trading with the Romans. They wanted coins of the same value, so they could easily trade. These coins have been recovered in multiple foreign locations as far away as India, and they were also the first Christian kingdom to put crosses on coins. Let's have a look. They were the first Christian kingdom to put crosses on coins. And this is their king, these are crosses on coins. Uh, Lydia says, yeah, to be powerful, you have to be ruthless back then. And that makes good sense. Yeah, that makes good sense. So, moon worship. Now, the Aksumite ruler was called the Nagusan Agast, the king of kings. Right. And King Ezana, he ruled from roughly 320 to 360 AD. And he converted to Christianity as verified by Aksumite coins. This was him... Notice, does that look familiar? Have you ever seen this symbol before, Thunderous? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it looks like a crescent and a star. Looks like, uh, yeah, and looks like it's something to do with the Bible. I, I might be wrong on that. But yes, so now you've got a crescent and a star. So he was a pagan. So he had coins with a pagan disc and a crescent. His later coins have crosses, right? So the later coins, you can see here again, so he's the first Christian king to put crosses on currency. Uh, um, Joseph was asking the question, when was this, about 200 AD? Uh, I just have the date right here, 320 to 360 <laughs> AD. So look, I mean, you can give or take, I don't know, plus minus 20 years, given, given the inaccuracies in the, in the history, but, but this is roughly this period, okay? These coins date to that period, so, so this is solid archaeological evidence. All right. And we do know that this kingdom was already practicing Christianity, if not officially, it was practicing Christianity in the first century and was strongly Christian by the by the by the fourth century, late third century. Yes, Thunders. Oh, I was just thinking. Uh, I'm just looking at the coins. It's at the top of the coin, you see the crescent with the star in the middle. Yeah, that's this one. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I find. I'll make a comment maybe in, in another show about those, but. Um, that's amazing. That's revealing. That's exposing. Yeah. So he was a pagan. He then converted to Christianity and converted all the coins. You can see now he becomes Christian. He now has the cross on the staff. He now has the cross. So he's the first Christian king. Now, Ethiopia is possibly the first Christian state. Its conversion to Christianity dates to roughly the same time as... Um... Oh, good grief. What is that state next to Turkey? That was in Armenia. Thanks. So... Aksum became the first sub-Saharan African state to embrace Christianity. 
King Ezana proclaimed Christianity state religion in the early 4th century. And for a century before that, Roman traders had brought knowledge of the Christian religion to the Aksumite mercantile network. And this is very important to understand that information travels through mercantile networks. Back in the day, information traveled through trade networks. These guys had a substantial trade network, and the guys before them, the Yemenis, had a substantial trade network. And that is how ideas, including religious ideas, flourished. Wow, Glory, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I'm so, Peter, Peter, thank you very, very much. Uh, I appreciate the, wow, appreciate that contribution. Thank you. Right. So in the 6th century, Aksumite King Caleb sent a force across the Red Sea to subdue the Yemenites. And he dominated South Arabia for about 70 years. And the Byzantine emperor supported Aksum largely due to Yemen's persecution of Christians. They were persecuting, persecuting Christians here in Najran. So the Yemenis were persecuting Christians in Najran. These guys responded by sending their forces across. They sent across a guy called Abraha. And we don't know, but they may or may not have sent him with a bunch of elephants. You guys may have heard of Abraha. Have you heard of Abraha? Abraha, that sounds familiar. The guy that attacked Mecca with the elephants? No, you, uh, I need to be reminded on that in one. In Islam, then. so the year of the elephant. Muhammad is born in the year of the elephant. That's the year that Mecca was attacked by King Abraha with his elephants. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, absolutely. Because Muhammad was born. Yeah, now you remind me. Abraha, yeah. Okay, let's continue. He was from Aksum. Yes, correct. In fact, he was sent by the, by the emperor, and Abraha went across here, conquered this whole area, took it over, and decided, you know what, I like it. I think I'll stay, and he split off from the king of Aksum. So, let's continue. Right. So, now the first church in sub-Saharan Africa. So, this is where I'll end today. I will, I will continue this section. We'll just finish this, and then we'll end here today. The first church in sub-Saharan Africa. This is from the Smithsonian Magazine, so it's not Wikipedia. The Church on Earth in Ethiopia rewrites the history of Christianity in Africa. Archaeologists can now more closely date when the religion spread to the Aksumite Empire. Okay, so let me continue here. Oh, let me just minimize that. So I'm just going to bring up this link. Okay, so this is Smithsonian Magazine, right? So this is from the Smithsonian. It's not Wikipedia. I'm not copy-pasting Wikipedia. But, of course, Abdul's are going to be saying exactly that in five minutes. Now, this church on earth in Ethiopia rewrites the history of Christianity in Africa. So this is a dig that happened not that long ago. At an archaeological site in Ethiopia, researchers are uncovering the oldest Christian basilica in sub-Saharan Africa, right? And in the dusty highlands, of northern Ethiopia team recently uncovered the oldest known Christian church in sub-Saharan Africa. And it's early, so they're talking now of one of the world's oldest kingdoms and its early conversion to Christianity. So this kingdom emerged in the first century AD and would go on to dominate much of Eastern Africa as well as Western Arabia. We've already shown the maps on that. So they, now this, this church was built in the fourth century AD, about the same time as when Roman Emperor Constantine legalized Christianity. Constantine did not make Christianity the state religion. He simply legalized its practice. And this is around 337 BC, right, AD, sorry. It may well be prior, okay? So it may well be prior, but now, so Christianity arrived at an early date nearly 3,000 miles from Rome, and this find suggests that the new religion spread quickly through long-distance trading networks that that linked the Mediterranean via the Red Sea with South with South Africa, good, with Africa and South Asia, shedding fresh fresh light on a significant era about which historians know little. Aksum was one of the world's most influential ancient civilizations, but it remains one of the least widely known, says Michael Harrow of Johns Hopkins University, the archaeologist leading the team. Your thoughts, Thunderous? No, it's not the first time that um, something like that. Um, I remember um, when Nineveh was founded in the 18th century, but before then, um, the Bible was mocked about uh, the Assyrian Empire and Nineveh. Yes. And then then it gets found, and it's now one of the better-known world powers of, the, of from the biblical narrative. I think with Isaac's, um, this is what we're finding now, from what I'm discerning. This too, the more archaeology is um, researched, the more about this power is going to be unearthed. Right. Now, they traded by camel, donkey, and boat. Okay, in silver 
olive oil and wine from the Mediterranean to cities along the Indian Ocean, which in turn brought back exported iron, glass beads, and fruits. And you can see the crosses here. You can see the cross here. Okay, So a stone pendant with a cross and the term venerable in ancient Ethiopian Gez. Right? So the kingdom began its decline in the 8th and 9th century, eventually contracting to control only the Ethiopian highlands. Right? Now, they were at one time peaceful with Islam, but of course Islam became more aggressive and the kingdom came under attack from Somali and then Ottoman armies. Now, now notice nearly half of all Ethiopians today are members of the Ethiopian Orthodox Tawahedo Church. Now, for those of you who don't know, have you heard of the Tawhid Thunderous? Uh, that would be um, something to do with the, the, only, the worship of only one God. There's only one. God is one. Allah is one. Tawhid. Uh, for those who are interested, the Ethiopian, Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhedo Church, this Gez word, is the origin of the word Tawhid in Islam. The, I was going to ask you, because we're about to finish now anyway, but... Um, I wanted to ask you a question. Well, we seem to be finding a lot of words. And now, if anybody that's ever spoken to a Muslim about the Quran, one of the default um, defenses they have is, well, you've got to understand the Arabic. The root word can have up to 10 different meanings and such. Yes. Are, we, are we not seeing it, it historically, then, when we bring these things up, that the, the argument is going to... Because they've already set the, the foundation for one word can have 10 different meanings, that other words that are external to Islam, they're going to use the same kind of arguments with. So you can as have, to... Well, you can have secondary and tertiary meanings, but you will have primary meanings. You're, yes. going to have primary, you're going to have original meanings, early original meanings. Right? Um, yes, so, so yes, that is true. And Tawhid, we'll get into the meaning of Tawhid. We will come into the meaning of Tawhid, but this is relevant. This is actually you'll find that, that this was taken straight out of the Ethiopic Gez. It was the, the Tawhedo church. This is the, this is the source of the term Tawhed. Uh, Max Ten asks, were not most of these lands Christian until Mohammedans swept in, who then utilized both them and the Jews for their abilities while slaughtering and enslaving the rest? Uh, that's a fairly good summary, I would say. Now, notice, Christianity had reached Egypt by the 3rd century. Right? But it was not until Constantine's legalization of Christian observance that the church expanded widely across Europe and the Near East. With news of the Axumite excavation, researchers can now feel confident in dating the arrival of Christianity to Ethiopia at the same time frame. There's a story in the Gospels of a black man, and I believe it's one of the apostles, not Barnabas or something, that actually converts him and he Philip. travels. Yes? Philip, 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 Philip. he ran alongside yes. the Ethiopian eunuch in the Book of Acts, and the Ethiopian eunuch was reading aloud the Book of Isaiah. Yeah. Yes, correct. So, so yes, so that so the Christianity went to Ethiopia in the early in the first century already. So this find is, to my knowledge, the earliest physical evidence for a church in Ethiopia, as well as all of Sub-Saharan Africa. This is from Aaron Butts, professor of Semitic and Egyptian languages in Washington D.C. at the Catholic University. Yes. Can I ask a question? In that yeah. sense, then, is there any relationship or any historical evidence that's been found with reference to, to Judaism? Because if you follow the logic through. The Queen of Sheba came from Ethiopia, paid a lot of respect to Solomon, and then goes back. The eunuch was on, has obviously been to Jerusalem and, and went to worship at the temple and was on his way back. So there must have been some kind of strand of pre, uh, uh, or should I say, there must have been a strand of Judaism in Ethiopia prior to it um, going well, into Christianity. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tawhido Church is a little bit Jewish in its practice. Yes, it does retain a very strong Jewish flavor. And uh, we will speak briefly about the Ethiopian influences. We will do that. But that, that I've got for a separate presentation. But I want to focus on Yemen. I will be touching on Ethiopia. Then we'll focus mostly on Yemen. And later on, I'll go back to Ethiopia. But Ethiopian Christianity, which has a very strong Jewish element, right, has a strong and direct influence on Islam through numerous people. And yes, we will find that. Okay. Yeah. So notice this was home to temples built in a Southern Arabian style, dating back many centuries before the rise of Aksum. The temples reflect the influence of Sabaeans, who dominated the lucrative, the lucrative incense trade and whose power reached across the Red Sea. Now, what is interesting, the excavator's biggest discovery was a massive building, 60 feet long and 40 feet wide, resembling the ancient Roman style of basilica, which is interesting. Now, what is odd about this is that the Aksumite temple at Yeha that we spoke about, the temple of Al-Makkah, also happens to be exactly 60 feet long and 40 feet wide. So what they did was they simply took over an old temple of Al-Makkah and they converted it 
to a church. Now, later on, we will discover that the temple that we call the Kaaba today was once, apparently, an Ethiopian church that was converted to a mosque. So, yeah, small war. Now, in the research paper, they speak of this unusual collection of artifacts, right? A very unusual collection of artifacts that suggests these are bulls. These are, so these are pagan figures, like bulls' heads, pagan figures, right? Gold rings and various other things. So clearly evidence of pre-Christian beliefs. But the paper says that this is a mixing of pagan and early Christian religions. They have evidence in the earliest Christian sites that there was a mixed mixing of Christian and pagan beliefs. In other words, heresy developing. Right. So this would then lead to offshoots which are partly Christian, partly pagan, partly whatever the heck they are. Uh, your thoughts, Thunderous? No, you, you took the words out of my mind. I was, was going to say, would this at this point become fractured and splintered or cause a fracture and splinter? Yeah, correct. So here's a golden carnelian ring depicting a bull's head, very tiny from the excavation site. So these guys were able to work. This is 10 mils across. I mean, these guys were able to work. You know, that, that's fairly fine work for that era. So Christianity first came to Aksum in the 4th century when a Greek-speaking missionary named Frumentius converted King Azana. Okay, so this story is all about this, where we've got the story of Philip, but we know that this was Christian very early on. So this is what makes the discovery of this basilica. It is reliable evidence for a Christian presence northeast of Aksum at a very early date. And the spread of Christianity was intertwined with the machinations of commerce. In other words, again, information flowed through commercial networks. Right, religion flowed through commercial networks. Religious ideas, religious symbolism, flowed through these commercial networks. Long-distance routes played a significant role in the introduction of Christianity in Ethiopia, and the Aksumite Kingdom was an important center of the network, of the, of the trading network of the ancient world. This is Alem Seged Bardados, archaeologist at Addis Ababa University. So yeah, not Wikipedia. And I'll pause this here. Your thoughts, Thunderous, on, on this article. No, I, I, I'm, this is new for me, so I, I've not had a, um, time to think about formulating any thoughts on it. So this is new to me now. Yeah, so I'll pause here. I'll, I'll finish this slide just so you know, it's just we touch briefly on the connections to Ethiopia. But the very first hijra in Islam, the first migration, was to Ethiopia. The first hijra, the first migration in Islam was to Abyssinia, to Ethiopia. Muslims found refuge in Christian Aksum. Ethiopian Eritrea in 614 AD and a large number of them stayed there for 14 to 15 years influenced by this kingdom when the apostle saw the affliction of his companions and that though he escaped it because of his standing with Allah and his uncle Abu Talib he could not protect them so he said if you were to go to Abyssinia for the king will not tolerate injustice and it is a friendly country how did he know why were they friendly how were they friendly to him he knew the religion his companions um, went to Ethiopia. This was the first hijra. Yes? I, I wanted to ask, now, considering the, the locality of Ethiopia to Saudi Arabia, I've often wondered why is it then that Ethiopia, if I understand this correctly, is the longest Christian country in history? It's basically been Christian since it's become a state religion up until now. It's not been anything else. And why is Saudi Arabia and Islam historically kind of like kept away from it is there some kind of like uh, i wouldn't say pact because obviously we're generations away but some kind of historical respect in why they're they did try to take over the country there are a number of muslims in the country uh but a large number of ethiopians are obviously christian following the Tahido church but mm. i don't know i mean there's this there's, there's certainly links going way back from from family into intermarrying to uh, economic and trade links support during war and so on so yeah i mean uh, Ethiopians were often the, the soldiers who protected the trade caravans. They were um, people, in fact, one of them repaired and built the Kaaba, right? Um, Muhammad's wet nurse, who was with him from birth until death, um, was Ethiopian, right? Well, and there are numerous the references to Muhammad learning, hearing the Bible being recited by Ethiopians. Now, what is interesting is people debate whole day about the Bible. There was no Bible, no Arabic Bible. Well, Muhammad, according to the Islamic sources, spoke Ethiopian. The two languages Muhammad spoke was Arabic and Ethiopian, and he used to listen to these people when they had their services, right? And they would paraphrase the Bible into Arabic, and also he would listen to two brothers recite the Bible. Mm -hmm. So there would be this link. And Arabic, al-Hijra, 
where Muhammad's followers, the Sahaba, fled the persecution of the ruling Quraysh tribe. There's some interesting information about them we should also discuss at some point. The Aksumite king who received them is known in Islamic sources as the Negus, or the Najasi. Right? Some of the exiles returned to Mecca. They made the 622 to Hijra, Hijra to Medina with Muhammad. Others remained in Abyssinia until they came to Medina in 628. In other words, they stayed there for 14 years. So I'll pause here. So any final thoughts before we go? No, it's been a fascinating historical discussion um, and very, very well researched. You know, thank you. So, so thanks, guys. That's the first part of this. I'll pause here. So Josie Wells says Ethiopia, Eritrea, even the word Addis Ababa has Arabic roots. There's Islam across the Red Sea. Well, the thing is that a lot of words, um, a, l a number of words that people use here. For instance, have a look at this list. Uh, let me just go back here. Let's have a look at this list here, right? You'll notice Islam, this is from the book Foreign Words in the Quran by Arthur Jeffrey, right? If you look at my community page, you'll find this. I'll drop the link in the chat, in the comments later. But notice you have Syriac, Aramaic, Hebrew, Greek, Ethiopic, right? There's hundreds of Ethiopic words and also a lot of Greek words. We have to ask ourselves, why are there so many Greek words, right? And I will talk about that and I will get into that. Um, by the way, I had... <laughs> Finally, after six months, six months of back and forth, I finally met with Jay Smith. We recorded two episodes a couple of days ago, and uh, those should be aired next week, I believe. Uh, it remains to be seen, and uh, he's on he's on on a visit outside of the country right now. So once he's back, we will continue in two weeks. And uh, yeah, I will be talking about this Greek connection because it is very possible, very historically possible. Because why did two hundred and five Greek words in the Quran? Well, because, because there were strong connections to Greece, oddly enough, and especially the philosophy of Neoplatonism, right? So there's a connection there, and it's very, very possible that the founder of Neoplatonism is at least one of the people used as a template to model the Muhammad that we know. If you look at the parallels, it's actually very, very unusual and very interesting. So the founder of Neoplatonism may well be one of the people, and I will be presenting that when I when I talk with uh, with Jay Smith once that comes out as we go through the episodes, mm -hmm. and also I'll be talking to Alfadi tomorrow, and I'm supposed to be recording on Wednesday, and also doing some live streams with him. So guys, we'll see how that goes. Uh, any final thoughts, um, Thunderous? Before I run, run off, did I answer that uh, question? Yep. No, you, you have done. Um, the only I, I think I've made a comment before. It, the whole language thing with uh, Muslims and uh, Islam doesn't make sense if Adam was the first man. Um, speaking Arabic, direct Arabic from um, heaven onto earth. And 21 generations later, we have Yasser Qadi, where I put the clip up on uh, my channel, where he says that um, it, the Arabic language reached its peak with Muhammad. But surely that peak it would have been... It wasn't even completed at that point. No, exactly. So, so it kind of goes to show that the Islamic narrative contradicts itself because Adam was the first man. That w It would have reached its peak then when Adam was the first man on the planet. So we have to ask Muslims more questions about this Arabic language. And if it reached its peak with uh, Muhammad, then why are we finding all these alien words inside the text? Correct, correct. Yeah, and Indonesians don't speak Arabic. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, those are very good questions. I mean, really, you've, you've raised some very, very strong points. Marcus Steiner, thank you very much. Yeah. So, guys, I will call it here. Uh, we might come back in the week. I will. Uh, I just got a very busy week, as you know. Adam was not the first man, according to... Uh, look, according to Islamic sources, Muhammad was the first creation of, of Allah. So, he was there at the beginning. Um, yeah. But that, that's that's a discussion in itself um, that I've wanted to do with you about the light of Muhammad or Muhammad being the light. But that'll be for yeah, another time. Cool. So who, so Eva, who was the first man according to Islamic sources? Uh, Jesse Wales, yeah, Islam is a mixture of everything. Yeah. And Arabic is a mixture too. That it, those are correct on both counts. I believe that that is an accurate statement. So yeah, guys, I need to call it... Uh, Adam was not the first man according to Islamic sources. I'm not talking about that. Okay, I'm not, I'm not sure I understand either, but um, yeah, drop it in the in the comments later. Uh, Muhammad is no Muhammad goes back over a hundred thousand years. Muhammad goes back to the formation of the universe, mm -hmm. uh, Lydia. So that's the light of Muhammad. You you don't understand. Muhammad is very very. Uh, Adam received earth after someone. Yeah. So the earth was made for Muhammad. 
Muhammad was there at the beginning. Allah spoke to Muhammad and said, Muhammad, I'm going to make the universe. I'm going to make earth for you. And then Allah made the earth. And then afterwards, he placed Muhammad on the earth as a physical human yeah. being. Yeah. But uh, I'll just on this, I, I know we don't want to digress because it's a subject to suffer. If you go to my channel, there's actually a discussion by Yasser Qadi that says that the jinn were on earth before Adam was and they, they had their own wars and things on the planet, which interestingly, there's no archaeological evidence of, of these wars and jinns, but hey ho, that's Islam. Don't confuse us with the facts, okay? <laughs> <laughs> there were humans on earth. Uh... Oh, good grief. This has made the gin. So, yeah, Islam gets confusing. But, guys, we'll talk about this. Was he? Yes, yes, on Nathaniel. Muhammad was Allah's companion. And, in fact, look, very quickly because I don't want to go. I, but Allah is aloof. No one knows where Allah is. Where's Allah? Nobody knows, right? Allah is missing. He's aloof. Unfortunately, that, that is the, the way that it's seen in Islamic theology. So, Allah's power is gone, right? So, who runs the universe in Allah's absence? Well, there's a guy called Muhammad who just happens to be free right now. And you see, Allah's power keeps the, the, keeps the planets spinning in their orbits. And it keeps them turning on their axes. And well, with the absence of Allah, who's going to do that? Well, thank you, Muhammad. We appreciate you using the spirit of Muhammad, the Ruh Muhammadi, to do that while Allah is taking a holiday. That is Muhammad in Islam. Is there a guy in the Bible that, that speaks like that or is spoken of like that? You know, there's a guy... But he's not as powerful as Muhammad. I, I, there might be a guy, you know, there might be is a that guy. What, is, is that the one that stands behind uh, Muhammad while Muhammad is leading the prayer? Prayers, that guy. Yeah, I think that guy. <laughs> this is a very, Veronica, yes, this is an incredibly bad copy of the Trinity. It is, it, seriously, I should take, take you through those sources. It's, it's, it's incredible. Muhammad is what moves the earth. He's what moves the moon. He's what moves the tides. He is the primum mobile. He's the force that moves everything, that keeps the clockwork of the universe running in Allah's absence. It's his power. In the absence of Allah, it's Muhammad's power that keeps the earth, keeps the universe running, believe it or not. Guys, I need to go. So thank you all very much for your time. I hope it's been interesting. Thunderous, thank you for the very, very enlightening questions. Man, those questions, yeah, yeah, those hit hard. And thank you very much. So no, but thanks, my guys. pleasure. And um, I'd like to say thank you to the audience, to all those that, um, that are listening uh, now and uh, participated. Big shout to you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Take care, guys. Good night. God bless.